Hello golfers, it's Kevin Robofsky again. Back in Hawaii, glad to be back here at the KMR School of Golf, Koalau Golf Course. Yes, we're still open. Come on over for a lesson, get the full experience. I wanted to address some questions that arose from my first Macro Grady video, 1986 swing explanation. And some questions came via email um, and I thought there would be wise to go over some of these um, ideas in a little bit more detail. First of all, um, we see on YouTube a swing of early Mac with no shirt on and shorts. And I think that's pre-1986. I think that's either 85, 84. What leads me to believe that is at one point Mac's posture, he believed in sort of sitting down this way. So that the spine would be almost vertical. And um, what you'll see as a result is a lot of knee flex, kind of a straight spine and kind of a flatter backswing. Uh, I think he did that in pre-86. Part of that was the idea of creating balance. Again, in this, in this um, kind of time era, this time frame, Mac is very much thinking about anatomy and neurology. So neurologically, you know, balance is very important to coordinate the movements in space and have a consistent swing. So balance is, is integral. So I think that's what he did. So you're gonna see that swing varies um, differently from the 86, 87 uh, swing. So uh, I would, that came up in terms of that YouTube video being different. And I think that was pre 86. Um, Next point I want to mention is uh, knee flex and specifically, you know, kind of in or out. I think Mac, uh, basically, he, in different time eras, he, he advocated both. So there's, there's videos where Mac advocated more of a pinching in of the knees um, and a tightening of the legs. And then there's other eras where he had his knees more out and uh, as more as a like shock absorbers sort of to you know stabilize the lower body uh, I, I would say somewhere in the middle is probably best um, and again this is a little bit of a case-by-case -case scenario if you're a golfer who has a lot of knee movement especially right and left sliding probably a little bit of a pinch in would be a beneficial so or tightening of the quads that would be beneficial if you're limited in terms of power and uh, club head speed. Um, pinching in the knees is probably going to um, restrict that. So uh, having the knees a little bit more apart um, can help you turn more. So, you know, I would say that it's a case by case situation somewhat and probably for the vast majority of people, somewhere in the middle is, is better. Knees um, pretty much over the feet is a good idea right? in terms of anatomical alignment um, and also we want your knees in the same basic direction as your feet right so if your if your feet are flared out and your knees are pinched in creates a lot of tension and you know we want to also save your knees right so it's not good to twist and turn when your knees are pinched inward um, so you got to be careful with that uh, and this is also has a little bit to do with the foot flare. The reason the right foot is flared out 10 degrees is to help you turn. Now, if you flare it out too much, you can overturn. Right? If you don't flare it out at all, you're going to underturn with too much restriction and then vice versa for this way. So here we're looking for about a 45 degree hip turn in the backswing. So 10 degrees for most people is a good, you know, sort of general idea of how to get 45 degrees of hip turn. Now in the follow through, we're gonna go 90 degrees hip turn, right? So our hips are gonna be basically perpendicular to the target line. And we're gonna to need to have the, the left foot a little bit more flared out. So, you know, double. So 10 degrees, 45 degrees, 20, 20 degrees, 22 degrees, should get you all the way to 90, right? And again, that's gonna be case by case. A lot of this is the interpretation of these concepts, these principles to the individual body. And I think that was what Mac was very brilliant in, in this era was being so 
um, flexible in terms of how each individual's body is going to interpret um, these principles. So um, that covers the knee flex. Uh, a couple just more broader points. How do we create both connection and width in the swing? Right, because the two seem to be opposing. And we hear, we hear having a wide arc a lot, and we hear connection a lot. And how do we sort of combine the two in a harmonious fashion? And I think Mac did this very well. Um, basically, but you know, the explanation is, is very simple. The connection is the upper arms against the armpit, against the upper pectoral muscle, right? So you feel the pressure point. That's the pennies under the arm, right? Boom. All right, elbows should be together, not out like this. We don't want to create too much space here because then the elbow positioning, you know, gets into that chicken wing, what we call position number three, right? Flying elbow or chicken wing, right? We want the elbows together more in what we call position one. So the elbows can be a little bit pinched together. That's probably a good feeling. The wrists are going to be relaxed. So this is where you're going to feel very um, tension free. In the, in the wrist joint itself. Okay, that's what's going to help us with speed. So when I have my um, arms pressed against the side of my upper pectoral muscle, I have connection and I'm going to keep that connection back and through. Now the width part is the wrist cock, right? How much your wrist cock, right? Now this is, this is very tricky because most people cock their wrist more than they think. Right, they over flex the, both wrists and both elbows. So part of that is because the tempo of the backswing is so fast, they just whip it back, everything flexes, everything bends, the club goes past parallel. So as soon as you get past parallel, you know, you're, you're, in, a, you're in a situation where timing becomes more variable. So the width part is keeping your wrists cocked maximum only 90 degrees. For a lot of people, that almost feels like no wrist cock, right? A no wrist cock backswing, for a lot of people, cocks the wrist 90 degrees. It's just the difference between what's, what the feeling is and what reality is. That's why video is such a useful, useful uh, tool, because oftentimes what we think we're doing is not what we're doing. So if I go back like this, I'm going to have my arms pressed against my body, my wrists, my hands are low, right? And that's going to preset the wrists. And I'm basically going to feel like I'm in that same position all the way up, keeping the pressure points, and then all the way down, and then all the way through. So there's a minimal of disturbance from address, top of the backswing, impact to finish, right? So if you're not changing those angles that much, Right? Your swing should be much more consistent. Right? If I cock my wrist, you know, 135, 140 degrees, right? have this thing real sharp coming down like that, like a lot of people want to create lag to get power, but you actually, you get this stuck, right? And that's that's got to, your hands have to at some point take over, right? You can't just let the rotation of the body, the unwinding of the hips release the club, right? because it, it's too sharp, right? So a lot of times people have a, a problem with that type of um, that pattern. And I think that was, again, I talked about this in the, in the earlier version, uh, one area where I would have probably disagreed a little bit with the 86 version, especially with the driver, is having Mac had a lot of wrist angle, almost too much wrist angle in the downswing. So I would say just 90 degrees. I think that's the most consistent angle you can create in the swing. A lot of that's going to be created just by address and the low hands. Right? And then momentum's going to cock your wrists in the backswing a lot more than you realize. You don't have to consciously use your wrists in the swing. You don't have to consciously rotate your hands, rotate your forearms, right? So Mac made this a point a lot in, in that mid 80s area, uh, 86, 87. No forearm rotation, no club face rotation in the swing, right? So that means when I come from this angle, right? If I have no forearm rotation, it, it's more vertical like this, right? So forearm rotation is going this way, right? And then a lot of times what you'll see in the later Morad stuff is, is the shaft at the top is pointing to the left. 
right? A lot of people now, one, one sort of uh, interpretation is this is on plane, right? Because it's pointing you know, towards the target line. Another interpretation is it's laid off because when the shoulders turn 90 degrees, the shaft should be more down the line, right? If the shaft and the shoulder turn are working in unison, right? I think that was the original idea. So if I go from this angle, if I P1, P2, P3, P4, my shaft is more down the line at a, at a 90 degree shoulder turn. If I turn my shoulders 100 degrees, it's gonna be slightly crossing. So you're gonna see max swing in 86, 87 has a little crossing at the top and it's a little bit more parallel to even past parallel with the driver um, in that 86, 87 version. It didn't hurt him at all. Obviously he won um, and uh, won not being a great putter. So, I mean, his ball striking had to be better than the typical PGA Tour champion because his putting was definitely um, substandard than the typical PGA Tour winner in 86, 87, right? So um, that sort of explains this idea of having both connection and width. The connection is the upper arms against the chest. The width is the, the, the feeling that your wrists don't consciously break or cock in the backswing. That's, that's the width. Um, another kind of related idea to this is Mac both advocated sort of in the downswing, the feeling of a blocking action, right? So gosh, it usually has a negative connotation. A blocking action in the downswing? We well, don't wanna block it to the right, right? So why would you say that? And then at the same time, Mac wants a very sharp recocking of the wrists, right? Uh, at P8, at, uh, at P8.5, P right? So here's P7 is impact, P8 is where the shafts parallel to the ground, 8.5 in the 80s version is where the right arm is parallel to the ground, shaft gets more, gets vertical back to 90 degrees, right? So how can you have, you know, that very fast wrist cock, recock, and then at P8 and 0.5, and then also have a blocking action? Well, actually it, it works. Um, Generally speaking, if you advocate a stronger grip, if you're new to a stronger grip and you have your left hand rotated over here 45 degrees, if, you, if you've normally had it, let's say 10 or, or zero, and I rotate your hands over 45 degrees like this, that twisting action, and then just try to make the right hand somewhere in balance, whether it's 20 or, or 30 or 40, you know, that can be a little bit a case by case. But basically the right hand and the left hand should match. So both hands should be slightly this way, right? Diagonal. And when I when we when we do that to golfers, right, the first thing that they usually say if they're not used to it is they're gonna hit it left. Right? They're gonna they're gonna feel that by the stronger grip, the club face is gonna be uh, more closed in their swing than it's been. It doesn't mean that it's closed relative to the plane line. It just means it's gonna feel more closed to them than they're used to. And they're gonna feel like it's gonna to go to the left. So what you wanna advocate, okay, yes, it's gonna to go to the left if you do your normal release. So you're gonna see golfers with the weaker grip, they're gonna rotate the, the club to the right open, and then it's gonna be open at the top, and they're gonna have a little bit over the top move and usually an, an early uncocking of the wrists. You know, the better player might even look like, you know, look like that, right? And that's the brain's um, attempt at trying to get it back to squared impact, right? It's got to throw the, the club head a little bit early, right? And you're going to lose a lot of power. You're going to lose a lot of compression at the ball. And, you know, you're going to hit it high and kind of squirrely. So what, um, when you go to the stronger grip, the feeling the, that you want to have in the downswing is that you're going to delay the release, almost feeling like you're going to block it to the right, right? So you, at one, one part of your brain is saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to hit it to the left because my hands are twisted on the club this way. The club's going to be closed, right? Okay, so let it feel closed and then come on down and then block it, block it straight, right? That's the, really the feeling. And then after you go past impact, boom, very quickly you recock it. So you get the club head speed and you get the, the nice 
uh, symmetry and centeredness of your spine, right? So if you didn't recock your wrist, right, you're gonna, your arms are gonna pull your uh, upper body, your upper torso force, uh, forward with, with the momentum. So that will, that will look like this. Right? And then you'll try, to, you'll try to back it up later on so you don't you know, walk down the fairway, right? So the recocking of the wrist, number one, it creates the speed, but it also keeps you centered. Right? And keeps you balanced. Boom, I can stop right here. Right? So I'm gonna put on the brakes. Right? What am I putting on the brakes? My shoulders and my arms. I'm gonna put them on the brakes. My club head's gonna release when I do that. If I don't, let's say I just accelerate my shoulders and I keep accelerating my arms, right? It looks like that. And you'd actually, you actually get less club head speed. So if I'm trying to speed up the club head through the ball, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on the braking action. Shoulders and arms, club's going to go through. Right? But, I, but before that point, with the strong grip, I have to feel like I'm holding it off first. I'm delaying, I'm delaying, I'm delaying, holding, holding, holding. It's that blocking feel, and then phew, release upward and stop put on the brakes right and then you have perfect balance it's like the gymnast sticking the dismount you know and then so the idea there is that you're just gonna have more consistency right your follow-through is a good indication of how machine like your swing is right so if you if you're following through in a contortion every single time and you can check that by just having someone video you then you're just not going to be very consistent. You know, your, your anatomy and, and neurology is not going to be able to reproduce the movement pattern you know, within you know, the, the, the confines that the golf swing re re requires. So that's a, that's a very, very important point. So with a strong grip, you can feel like it's a blocking action in the downswing, and then you can fully release and stop. So that's going to lead me to my next point where you don't have to move your upper body, your upper torso to the left in the backswing or in the transition into the downswing. So later Morad, uh, late 90s, early 2000, Max started to advocate a little more lean to the left and then a further lean coming down to create a center of gravity point uh, left of the ball so you could hit the ball first and the divot second. Right? So this did not exist in 86. And stack and tilt, you know, sort of elaborated on that and created a whole system on that lean to the left. A little bit of a, a little bit of a, almost a diving action to the left and then tilting it back uh, in the finish. So I think this is a little bit um, hard on the brain as opposed to trying to just consciously stay rotating on a fixed center, a fixed point. And you can stay on a fixed point and still hit the ball and the divot after if you have the blocking action or the delayed release of the wrist. So if your hands are moving forward, right, at some point the wrist then will uncock and hit the ball and go into the ground, into the divot, especially if you keep, at this point you have some knee flex Right? So if you come out of your knee flex early, you, you'll top it. But if I stay in my knee flex, right, I'm going to hit the, the, the divot in front of the ball, and then I'm going to straighten my left knee, the hands are going to work around the arc, and then right back up. So I can get the full release of the club and still hit the divot. Right? Now if I straighten my knees, I'm going to be more of a picker. Right? So that's why the knees have to stay flexed at impact. Right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a timing. You're never gonna eliminate all timing in the swing. So, you know, you just wanna try to make it simple. Your knees are flexed at address. You're gonna maintain flexion back, down, through the ball, and then it's gonna straighten, not completely lock, but it's gotta straighten to get the hips to rotate, right? So you've gotta get, you've gotta unwind your hips to get the body to square up and unwind all that energy through the ball. Right? But you, what you don't have to do is you don't have to consciously lean ahead of the ball and then back it up. Right? Again, tough on the brain. 
right? Neurologically, it's much easier to stay centered, right? I just turn my shoulder, look like this, right? I'm just gonna rotate back. I love what Max said is that one of his ideas was you just, you go to the top, rotate on a fixed axis, and then from this point, you just, you just replace your left shoulder with your right shoulder. And stay, and you stay tilted sideways as your hips unwind because your left knee is straightening into a slight micro bend not locking or hyperextending right? and so this solves that problem with the delay of the uncocking of the wrist hands moving forward you can still hit the ball and the divot afterwards staying centered right? and this i this idea of um, your head also being tilted at address so this is another issue that started to happen in the in the 2000s especially Mac advocated the the right eye and the right ear being lower than the left in this direction um, what this does is it makes the fluid in your ears called the endolymphatic fluid it creates um, a an imbalance a tilt right so this disrupts the vestibular function right which basically means you're out of balance right? and, and your, your brain is going to have to then make the corrections in, in the middle of the swing, which we don't want. Right? We want to minimize the amount of corrections or adjustments um, in the middle of your swing. It creates less variables. So uh, 86 Mac, 87 Mac, the eyes were level and uh, also parallel to the target line. Right? Easy on the brain. That's the direction we want to hit it. No shifts in the plane line, no closed stance, taking it inside and then shifting the plane line to the left in the middle of the swing, right? Creating complexity, right? Lots of adjustments happening all at once, right? Back in 86, eyes were level, um, parallel to the target line, 90 degree rotation, right? And then replace the left shoulder with the right shoulder, stay tilted, right? And then come down the way you came back. It's just basically the strong grip. You're gonna have to work on the delay, right? So you're gonna have to delay the uncocking. Your hands are gonna have to move forward longer, right? And then you, as your left knee straightens, your wrists are gonna recock upward, right? And that's what gives you that nice, perfect look of balance, right, in the, in the follow through. Um, I'm gonna hit one here and kind of demonstrate it. Mac also advocated the waggling process is basically keeping the body in motion so that you don't get static and you can create a nice swinging motion if you're waggling or just priming your muscles, you know, um, back and forth, a little rocking both of your feet and your wrists, right? So staying in motion, a little waggle. That's why I hover the club also to keep my, cut my hands feeling low, back up. One way that can help you um, stay in your tilts and, and have the correct follow through where you're not over rotating in the follow through, not popping up, not coming out of the shot is keeping the eyes down on the ground longer. So your club's got to pass your head. It's got to pass your eyes, right? Your vision is staying down as the club's going forward. Right. This is a very important point if you're gonna if you're gonna release the club correctly and square it up. Right. So uh, one way you can do this is you can hit a lot of shots, uh, especially for practice, not even looking at the result. Right. So it takes a it takes a great amount of discipline, but with some practice, um, it becomes very easy. So I did not even see where that shot went, right? I just looked at the divot. You can hear the sound, the compression, right? You can see that also limits how much I can follow through, which is a good, that's gonna help you put on the brakes, right? I'm still gonna get my wrist through, but I'm not gonna keep unwinding hips, shoulders, arms, and head, and get into a contortion where I'm out of balance and every swing is gonna be different. 
the goal here is to be machine-like, right? So to be machine-like, your anatomical joints have to be in balance and have to be in alignment, right? So this whole thing is working in harmony, right? So that means arms, club head, body rotation, um, and footwork, right? Everything is working in sync, right? So the, the challenge of the golf swing is no matter how you swing, you gotta sync it up, right? So the more complex the swing is, generally you're gonna have to do a lot more repetitions, a lot more practice, and again, you know, it's kind of, it can be variable, right? So to take variation or variables out of the swing, I think that was a tremendous uh, goal and uh, and and purpose of this system from especially 86. So I'm gonna hit one in this direction. Get myself in that low posture, stay in the waggles, nice relaxed arms, cock the club up, stay in my tilt, come on down. So you'll notice in my swing, my right foot stayed at about a 45 degree angle. This helped me stay in my tilt. Now, depending on what club I'm hitting, um, my stance might be narrower with some of the shorter irons. My knees might come together like this. So my right foot's gonna be 45 degrees. But as my feet get wider with the longer clubs, my knees aren't gonna come quite together. Although I don't wanna have my right knee straight like this and create this huge gap. So that would be, that would be um, the wrong usage of your right leg. But what we're trying to do in the downswing is basically unwind, return back the same way we came down. I'm gonna delay my hands, and then as my, as my left knee straightens, my right knee is gonna come forward. Right? I'm not gonna be like this. My, and my toe is not going to be crunched and a lot of wrinkles on my on my back foot. It's going to be up, right? So this is called plantar flexion, right? But it's also not going to be 90 degrees, right? Because then I'll, I'll come out of the tilt. It's going to be slightly under 90 degrees. It's going to change depending on the club, right? But about 45 is a, is a good reference point, And that's going to keep you in your tilts. So that basically you can just get into this turn and turn right replacing the left shoulder with the right shoulder right that's a very nice way to approach the swing um, when it comes to driver right I'm not going to take a divot obviously and I'm gonna be focusing more on sort of that whip like action so definitely club head speed is, is something I'm is very desirable Right? And we're gonna get that speed again through a lot of the, the body rotation. My, my, my shoulder turn might go a little bit more than 90, right? But the same idea, the arms and the body are working in unison. So as I turn my body, my hands go to the inside, my arms follow, right? That lines it up, right? Go continue, probably gonna turn a little bit more than 90, get a little more power also to create my head and my upper torso slightly behind the ball so I can catch it on the upswing, right? I wanna use a high T. Long drivers use a high D, right? Catch the ball slightly on the upswing and from the inside, right? So those things all are aided by a little bit bigger shoulder turn, right? And basically I'm gonna stay behind the ball as much as possible. And again, it's, what's gonna help is keeping my eyes down, not being a, in a hurry to see the result. That's what we want to avoid. So same kind of idea. I want to create that nice swish sound. Waggle, everything is loose in my wrist, but my arms are pinched together, right? And right back down. You know, that, that was a nice look. That's at least how my body interprets the look of the 86, 87 swing. So I, was, I didn't go back slow, I swung the club back, right? And, uh, and created a lot of swish, 
right? A lot of speed. And the, basically, it's very hard to refute this. The louder you can make the club head swish, the faster your club head speed is. So you want to increase that. Number one, go back, go back kind of on the faster side, especially with the driver. Um, and make sure you turn the full 90 to 100 degrees and then recock those wrists real fast. Don't turn it over, right? Just recock it upward, right? Still use the strong grip, right? So the feet are gonna be a little bit wider with the driver um, and the tee's gonna be high and um, my head's gonna be maybe slightly behind the ball. And as I turn, I'm gonna turn a little bit more than 90, head's behind the ball. I'm gonna unwind, return the same way I came back, keeping my head behind the ball, everything else whew, the same, except no divot. I wanna swish, right? So you gotta practice swishing that club to get that club head speed, right? So it's very hard to get high club head speed with a slow backswing, right? Now that, then that's why you wanna have the pressure points, arms against the chest, so that you and also the wrist feeling like no wrist cock so that you can go back with some speed and not over swing past parallel where you're going to create a lot of you know um uh variable hitting right so um that pressure point and the feeling of the wrist not consciously cocking that's going to eliminate the club going past parallel and you can swing back fast and come through even faster Right, so you're going to need some momentum in the backswing to get that club accelerating even more. Right? And so that's a very important point in terms of getting club head speed. So I think that covers a lot of areas that uh, people had questions with. And I hope this is valuable. And uh, again, you can write your comments and uh, you can drop me a line if you have any more questions or want to take a lesson. Um, it's all good and I want to thank everybody that's interested in in this style of swinging and uh, At some point it'd be nice to bring this system back to the forefront of golf instruction again. Aloha everybody